Before we begin, a quick disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment and information purposes only. It should not be relied upon as a base for any investment decision. Nothing here is a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any security. Either the host, guests, or clients of either may own securities discussed on this podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Special Situations Cast. I'm your host, Bram de Haas, and today we have a super interesting guest, um, Dave Waters. He's the founder of Alluvial Capital. He's focused on value opportunities in small companies and thinly traded companies. Um, it doesn't matter where they can be uh, traded in the US or internationally. And he also writes a very well-known blog, uh, especially for people that are uh, interested in like the smaller uh, type of microcaps. Uh, welcome, Dave. Thanks very much. I'm excited to be here. Uh, well, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to have you. Um, hey, I was um, I was reading I was reading about you, and something that really stood out to me was that you referred to Alluvial Capital, which is your firm, and you call it your life's work. I thought that's um, that, that's like a cool statement. It it really. Um, it says that you have a lot of skin in the game, and um, yeah, it was it was in, it was so interesting to me. Why did you come? Up, why did, why did you put it that way? Good question. Uh, honestly, I don't know how else I would put it. I I started Alluvial because there was nothing I found more enjoyable as a hobby, as a, as a pastime than researching and learning about uh, obscure companies uh, around the world. I just found it so endlessly fascinating. Uh, eventually, I started thinking, well, I need to find a way to make this my career. I need to find a way to, to get someone to pay me to do this. And uh, fortunately, that I, I was able to do that. And I, I know, for without a doubt, that this is what I want to pursue for the rest of my life. Uh, I'm 35 now. I, I really hope I'm privileged enough to still be doing this when I'm 85 in some sense. Uh, it's, it's the topic that fascinates me more than anything else. And I, I really am the, the consummate uh, investment nerd. And so there, it's no exaggeration to say that this is my, my passion and it, it is my life's work. Yeah. I think, um, well, some people, uh, can relate to that, especially uh, those who, sure. you know, spend a lot of time, uh, in the micro caps. Mm-hmm. Um, you're thinking still like what, why are you so certain? Like this is, this is it for you. <laughs> uh, did you never have the feeling, uh, before or? Um, I guess I first stumbled upon the, the whole universe, uh, of micro caps and, and unlisted stocks. It's, uh, not too long after I graduated college, I was working in the financial industry, but at a large bank that did mostly trust banking and very conservative, very, very boring, uh, not at all interested in any sort of investment off the beaten path whatsoever. It was, oh, here, But it was like a wealth a, management thing, right? That's right. It was a, a large wealth manager and, and they did fine for their clients who were mostly mm-hmm. already incredibly rich people. But, but I thought, you know, here I am, a young guy with a long uh, time rising ahead of me. If I, if I really want to make some great returns in the market, I, I can probably improve my chances by looking where, where few other people are. And, and maybe even by being willing to take on some risks that others won't. And uh, I think I'll be rewarded over any medium to long term time frame. And, and so that's where I got my start. And I was fortunate in that it happened to be a good time to do so. I mean, this was 2010, 2011. There was a lot of very, very cheap companies just after the financial crisis. A lot of investors were still too afraid to invest in small companies. And a lot of companies' um, earnings and, and balance sheets were still recovering from the crisis. And it was a good time to buy cheap. And fortunately for me, that worked out very well. Sure. Did you, uh, um, were you already investing in uh, like very small companies through the crisis or uh, you started right after? <laughs> I wish I'd been. Uh, the truth is my personal investment account was probably never more than a couple thousand dollars until mm-hmm. a few years after college. Uh, 
yeah, things were <laughs> a little tight during college and it took me a little while to build up a good income and, and get going. But this, the very meager investments that I did have were, were very much uh, in small companies. Uh, I've never really owned um, anything, anything big. It's just never really okay. uh, appealed to me. So you, st- you started off right uh, in the best part. Well, I don't know if I started off right. Uh, some of my early investments definitely were terrible in the end, but that was well before I knew anything about, about value mm-hmm. investing or had any real good formal investor education. But there's really no way to get that except by investing for yourself and, and making mistakes. And ideally, you make your worst mistakes when you, early on when you have the least money. If your first investments are great, you're probably waiting too long uh... To, to get in there and you'll probably be, and you'll probably be, be overconfident and you won't learn as much as you would if some of your early investments go poorly <laughs> really blow up yeah that's mm-hmm. that's that, that could be true um um uh, and that's that's something else that's kind of interesting to me so you really uh, I, I mean i understand why you went for the small companies um that, that you are you probably also read like a lot of of commentary or um, theory about why those areas are very fruitful mm-hmm. because they're so neglected. Um, but still, I, sometimes it's so mysterious to me that there are like people that gravitate towards this area, but and it's all um, just so different from like being in the avant-garde, like cool companies that have to do with like the novel technology of the time and what those are, it's always shifting which yeah. you never have the cool stuff, you know? Um, and um, I remember there's a quote from, uh, I think from Canal Capital. He says something like, if I'm talking about my, uh, my investments, I'm just rattling off a list of, list of bad things about these companies. <laughs> um, and I've had that similar experience that you talk to investors or something, and you're just rattling off like a list of, why do you, grav- do you think that's, a different kind of people that gravitate more towards like um, those fixer uppers instead of the cool apartments or I do think it, it's a, just a particular kind of person uh, when I talk about these sort of investments that I that I do to someone who doesn't know me well or, or someone I've just met and I, I tell them about it they're either perplexed and kind of confused like why would anyone do that or they're really really interested uh, I, I rarely get a reaction in between there. Some people just get it yeah. and some people don't. And not that everyone has to invest this way. I mean, clearly people make plenty of money doing other things, but this is an extremely valid and rewarding way of investing. And, uh, but it does take a particular kind of person. I don't know if it can be taught or whether it's, uh, whether it's innate, but there is a small but very active and committed community of people dedicated to this sort of investment. Cool. As you know. Yeah. Hey, and you, uh, you, so you started out as a private investor around the crash. You were still a private investor. And then um, you uh, actually transitioned into wealth management. You started with managed accounts and now you're running a fund. Um, mm-hmm. is, is that very different that you're... Yes, uh, it's very different. Um, you're right. I started out just managing my own capital. Uh, then I went into separate accounts and eventually a few years back launched, uh, launched a fund. And it, there's been changes uh, along each step of the way, but the biggest change from, was going from managing only my own capital to managing capital on the path uh, of other people. And the biggest difference is if you're investing your own money, it's much easier to sleep at night. You can do your own investments, your, your own research, and you can buy your own companies. And if they do poorly, you don't feel too bad about it. You think, I'll just wait around sooner or later uh, the market will come around and I'm right. Or, or eventually you realize you weren't and you just sell and, and you feel dumb, but really the only damage you did to your own, uh, your own assets. When you're managing money for other people, it's a much higher responsibility. Uh, I try not to forget that some people work their entire lives to build up this amount of capital and they need it. And, and, uh, and they're trusting you to do your very best work. And so just, Mistakes will happen, but they're not excusable. Uh, You'll make mistakes, but you always have to be improving and you have to do your diligence and and take it very, very seriously because 
This is a huge responsibility that someone's entrusted you with. So that does make it a little harder sometimes if you buy something and it performs poorly, even if you think that ultimately it'll be a very successful investment, but you feel the pressure because you know that somebody's going to look at their account statement or, or get a letter or, or anything from you and they're going to have questions about why this isn't doing well. And, and you have to have a satisfactory answer, even though sometimes there isn't. Sure. So like the, the drawdowns are a little bit harder. Uh, mm -hmm. You're experiencing them together. Yes. And um, maybe uh, lagging the market for like uh, some time. That's, that's harder. It is. But you know what? You, you have to be willing to, to lag the market now and then, or you'll never really uh, truly outperform in the long term. You can't try to be totally in step in sync with the market at all times, or, or really you're just running a momentum strategy. And momentum sure. strategies can work, but again, it takes a certain sort of person to run that strategy, and, and I'm not that person. Value strategies work too, but they do spend times that they're just out of sync with the market, and you end up looking out of touch or, or foolish, and, uh, but you have to have confidence that you've done your work and, and you're not missing factors that the market is not. But, and it takes some sweat and some tears, but if you do your work, you'll, you'll be fine. Great. Um, then um, you talked about like having, um, you know, the um, times that, that you're sometimes lagging the market as value investor. Uh, this is like a particularly difficult period for value investors. I know not yes. every value investor is experiencing that because that's the statistical uh, value investing, but it probably means that everybody is um, experiencing headwinds. Mm -hmm. um, what's like one of your worst investment stories? Or I always <laughs> love to hear those because you, you learn so much more from it than from uh, the winners that can be kind of random. Oh yeah, uh, it's, it's very, very informative to study losers uh, compared to winners. Uh, winners are boring. Oh, I did my research and I saw a trend or I found something the market did and I was right and I made lots of money, hooray. That's not very, it's a fun story to tell but it's not very informative. Um, losers are more interesting because you have to identify uh, what you got wrong. And ideally that helps you uh, avoid making the same mistake. And so probably one of my biggest losers from the past few years was a, uh, a coal company called Contura Energy. Uh, I thought the setup was really great. Uh, a lot of coal companies went bankrupt in 2015, 2016 because the price of thermal coal, coal that they use for power generation, went really, really low. Uh, and a lot of companies had too much debt, uh, their operating costs were too high, and they declared bankruptcy. Now, during that process, a lot of their less profitable mines were taken offline forever closed forever and so a lot of capacity left the market. And a lot of these companies, they went through the bankruptcy process, they restructured, they shed a lot of their debt, came out much leaner with a lower cost structure. Uh, and just at that time, the thermal coal market was recovering strongly and even more so than which is on fire. Um, there had been some demand, supply imbalances, and, and so when I invested in Contura, a couple of things attracted me. Number one, the shares had just started trading again after going through the bankruptcy process. They traded over the counter, so they were not very liquid. The company was not very well known. It was a very, very unpopular industry for good reason. Coal is dirty and it, it pollutes, and we're very wisely moving away from it, but for the time being, we still need it to power part of our electricity needs and it's still required for making steel most kinds anyway and so i thought here's a great setup for me here's a company trading at an incredibly discounted valuation it's illiquid it's little known and uh its fundamentals are improving rapidly because the price of coal just keeps going up all the time well i failed to reckon with the one of the iron laws uh, of commodities and that is higher commodity prices always create their own supply always it doesn't happen overnight but a period of high commodity prices whether it's oil or, or coal or gold or whether it's agricultural products or or, uh, or beef or, or pork always ends up in producers producing much much more and then the supply ramps up and then the cycle just goes well it, you hit the downswing when supply overwhelms demand and prices fall well that's exactly what happened to Contura. Now, it would have been okay if the company had responded rationally, 
by using their bumper earnings to pay down debt and pay some special dividends. But, but no, like every overconfident commodity company, they went out and did a big overpriced acquisition. They took on too much leverage to do so. And, and sure, sure enough, when the price of coal so began did, to dip, they did the, the go through bankruptcy and make an acquisition <laughs> in their playbook. They did. They made the very same mistakes that put them in bankruptcy in the first place. And I should have realized because some of the very same people were still in charge of the company. Um, yeah, they, they're really struggling now. They have a much better CEO in place now, but now the price of coal is much lower and they have a lot of debt. And we'll see if they make it through or not. I sold out a long time ago, but not after suffering a really pain, until I suffered a really painful loss. So just reminded yeah. me that when you buy a commodity company, you have to be buying during the position of maximum pessimism. If the, if the price of that commodity is already on the rise and everyone's getting excited, you're already too late. You missed the boat. Sure. Yeah. So, sometimes I do. I mean, uh, this is a great story, but uh, sometimes I think we fault ourselves a little bit too much. Like um, some of those coal companies, they are so cheap. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you probably need it like three years and it would have made, you know, its entire um, enterprise value or something in uh, yeah. free cash flow, free ca cash flow. And then and there, it, there was a coal company, Warrior, that came public sure. and then paid out more than its IPO price in dividends over the next couple of years. They did it right, but yeah. a lot of other ones weren't, weren't as smart. Yeah, I've been in that one for a little bit. Did huge buybacks. Um, mm -hmm. Share price still not great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're a, a well-run company. Dividends. I respect what they're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that's a great story. Um, and then um, if you, I mean, you, you've, you've, I mean, I think you've had a great run and you've made many great investments and now we're, we're, uh, we're starting off this conversation a little bit on the pessimistic side, but since we're in that, um, on that topic, um, when you have like a losing streak that things aren't, just aren't going well for some time, um, how do you deal with that or, um, yeah. Sure. Uh, it's a good question because every investor will have a period like this during their career. I mean, maybe we get lucky and we go a few years in between these periods, but they, they always come around uh, again. And I, I think the first thing you always do is, is recheck your assumptions. Um, we all have reasons for every stock that we own, every security we, that we buy. And we always have to be checking and rechecking those assumptions to, to make sure that they're true and make sure that they're supported by by the research that we've done and the data that we can find. Uh, I don't think there's ever been an investment I made where I, I made it and then I decided, okay, now I, know, now I don't need to learn anything else. I don't need to keep on looking at competitors. I don't need to evaluate how the industry or the economy is going. You have to, uh, it's like what Buffett says, right? He says, you can put your eggs in one basket, but then you have to walk. Uh, you don't have the luck of being passive about our investments if we're not doing an index sort of strategy. So I think the number one thing is make sure you're confident in, uh, in your discoveries. Make sure you're confident in your theses for, for every investment you make. And then if you've done that work, if you remain confident and very, very sure of the investment you made, um, you, can, you can feel a bit better. But I think another really important thing is to compare your assumptions uh, with people with, with other people, with other investors who, who are friends of yours or you respect. Uh, it's never a bad idea to have a second set of eyes. There's been times when I, I bought a stock or I was thinking about buying a stock and I was very, very excited about it, really, really bulled up. But then I thought, I wonder what so-and-so thinks about this. And I share my idea with that person and they're like, Dave, what are you doing? Did you think about this? Did you think about this? And sometimes I'm like, yes, I did. And here's my response to that. Other times like, Oh, I didn't think about that. That really, really changes things. It's important not to create an information bubble around ourselves because it's really, really easy to exclude or deflect any negative information that we just don't want to hear. That's a very human trait that we all struggle with. So get outside sources of information uh, and consider that you may be wrong. Well, we're all wrong from time to time. And sometimes, I mean, beating the market is very, very hard. The market is very, very efficient. And if we're out of sync with the market, if we're suffering a, a lagging stretch, it's, 
it's either the market is wrong or, or, or we are. And I think too many investors, especially some of the more dyed in the wool, uh, deep value investors can be far too stubborn and say it's the market that's wrong and I'm right. Well, not, that's not always the case. Always keep an open mind and be willing to change your mind. I mean, I think that's like a, a very hot topic for the, over the past few years. Um, sure. Yeah. To what degree? I mean, I think about the people who own Sears Holdings all the way from 150 or something to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and entire, the entire time, people were saying, oh, there's so much real estate value there. Oh, there's, there's great assets and working capital. And the whole time the market was saying, either no, there isn't, or there is, but it's going out the door every day. And every day it's worth less. And it, the market ended up being right. And people lost money there. But that's why it's important to get alternative perspectives and recheck your assumptions all the time. Yeah, I also think like Sears is like one of the premier examples of um, where like a hedge funder takes over operations and that can go uh, really well Yes, uh, and it can also go pretty bad. And um, I'm, you know, I often tr try to coattail these things, but it's very hit or miss. It's definitely not, oh, a hedge funder takes over and is going to put some, uh, you know, with his financial mind. Mm -hmm. this, this will work out. That's definitely not um, the, the default, or at least in my experience. Mine too. I think it's important to remember that even the best investors are, are human. We all have biases. We all have uh, ego issues and blind spots. And even the, the Bill Ackmans and the Warren Buffetts of the world are, are not immune to that. Yeah, sure. And I think, I mean, you cost yourself like an investment nerd at, at the start of this interview. I do that sometimes. And I think it's true for a lot of investors. Um, and we sometimes, you know, we fault CEOs for being promotional or, uh, but it's, it's a skill being a leader or. Uh, it is. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, let's see. If you, you're now managing like tens of millions of dollars. Um, yes. And that's a big change from during the crisis can you still buy everything you want like all the illiquid stuff that you um, uh, blogged about in the early years yeah the, the truth is no i mean <laughs> early on as i was writing on otc adventures i would write about stuff that maybe it was a dollar per share and it traded 500 or a thousand shares a week and okay. that was all fine for me sitting there with my four or $5,000 TD Ameritrade or account or whatever. I made money doing that. But the truth is, if you're managing a, a reasonable pool of capital, the, the ideas like that just don't move the needle anymore. So you have to shift your focus a little bit. But it doesn't mean there still aren't plenty of ideas where you can buy a quarter million, a half million dollars, even more. But, but you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's actually one of the biggest advantages about have, running a smaller pool of capital or even a personal account uh, is you can still buy $1,000 worth of something and it can double or triple and then even a small fund like, like one I run just can't do that. And so uh, I encourage uh, individual investors to take a look at some of the things that are even too small for the smaller funds. Um, sure. And uh, like, what's like one of the pitfalls there? Can it be that, um, there's like a lot of expenses for being a listed, uh, company or even, uh, uh, being OTC. I think there's still some expenses. Is that, is that a sure. pitfall or a danger of, uh, if you go like real small, like a few million dollars in market cap or tens of millions of dollars of market cap? You know, I think an important question to ask yourself whenever you're looking at a truly tiny company, I'm talking under 20 million uh, enterprise value. And, and the question is, why is this company public? Uh, it's very rare that a company that's that small with that low trading liquidity than its shares is actually getting any real benefit from being a public company. They're typically not using equity capital. Uh, they're not issuing shares because there's no market for them and the valuation is low. Um, you can access debt capital through a bank or something. You don't have to be a public company for that. Uh, I find that a lot of the companies this size shouldn't be public. They should have gone private a long time ago. Either management should have bought them out or they should have just found a buyer in private equity or, or a competitor. And 
a lot of the small companies that are public are basically a, a wealth transfer vehicle from shareholders to insiders and, and they're best avoided. Most of these companies have absolutely no chance of earning their, their, their cost of capital after paying 400, 600, 800,000, a million dollars a year in compliance costs just to do their filings and be public and they should go private. They're doing no one a favor by being public. So I try to avoid companies that really have no justification for being public and are public just so the CEO can claim that they're the CEO of a publicly traded company. And, and there are those type of CEOs. Uh, so it's more like a status symbol to be the CEO exactly. and maybe the salaries are like a big percentage of the profits. Um, That's an important thing to look at is how much gross profit does this company have to earn every year just to cover executive costs and, and the costs of being public. And you'll find that a lot of the time companies are paying egregious percentages of their revenues just to uh, pay for that country club membership for the CEO and pay that expensive auditor and, and uh, legal counsel for, to be public. And it makes no sense. Country club membership still a big thing. You still see it, company cars, sometimes flights. It's it's wild that it, it happens. Okay. I, I've got a quote from you here that I thought was uh, really cool. It's uh, digging into the accounting for consolidated investment with minority interests and equity accounted investments. is one of my favorite mental puzzles. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why, why do you like that though so much? Uh, that's definitely the nerd, the nerd part of me speaking, but, but it's really interesting. So I find that uh, it's not as common in the U.S. Most companies fully own all their divisions, but especially in places like Europe, it's very, very common for companies to, to own 60% of a subsidiary or 30% or something like that and have a lot of joint ventures for various reasons. They, they operate across borders a lot of the time. Sometimes it's easier to do it that way. But that can really distort the, the numbers that show up on the income statement in the balance sheet. Uh, it happens a lot with real estate companies too. You'll find a lot of them where they own, say, 20% of some apartment complex somewhere. And so on their income statement, you might see $200,000 in, in equity income for the year from that investment they have. But if you drill down and you take a look at the actual financials, of that segment, you might see that the segment is that that investment is giving them a million dollars or more a year in cash flow, and so just looking at the balance or the income statement, you might think, okay, two hundred thousand in equity income, maybe it's worth two million. But if you look at the actual cash flow they receive because of depreciation and things like that, you might conclude that it's worth closer to ten or fifteen million. So the the actual uh, economics of equity account and subsidiaries can be very, very different than how it looks in the income statement. And, and you won't know that unless you do some of the research and you really, really drill down. But that's another thing is just learning the quirks of financial statements. I think any serious uh, value investor who is doing fundamental research in companies needs to be very, very statement analysis. And, if you're not, that's one of the most uh, productive things to study in terms of increasing your, uh, your abilities. Cool. Um, and then uh, I'm thinking like lately, these kind of um, investment ideas are not working great. Like I'm thinking of like a asset plays. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with that statement at all? Or is it just my asset plays? Or, uh, <laughs> no. I certainly do. Uh, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I have a few asset plays myself and, and they've not performed lately. Uh, I think part of it is where we are in the market cycle. Um, part of it is on average, the, and I'm not saying that my asset plays are this way or, or yours are, but on average, following a long bull market, the remaining companies that trade below the value of their assets tend to be lower quality because a lot of the high quality ones either while well, the price went up a long time ago or they were brought out by someone. And oftentimes the companies that still trade below current assets or below real estate or, or whatever, uh, they, at the end of a long bull market, have some kind of issue, whether it's uh, con a controlling shareholder who doesn't care about the value of the company or, or just some, some aspect of the company that makes them less attractive for investors. So that's, that's one part of it. 
But secondly, there's just a, I find that financial markets have a kind of gravity where the most popular, most successful companies just tend to suck in all the investment capital from everywhere else. And for the past couple of years, it's, it's been nothing but tech, tech, tech. I mean, no one can have enough tech. Every tech company is worth some huge multiple revenue. And I'm not saying that a lot of these companies aren't great and a lot of them aren't, aren't worth a very high multiple of, of revenue and cash flows, whatever, but not all of them are. But those companies get so much attention that it seems to be that's the default place to allocate capital. If you have excess cash, you don't go looking for some cheap, statistically cheap company that has great cash flow or assets. By default, people's thought process goes to, I need to own more tech. And it just gets the most attention and just sucks in all that capital. It doesn't last forever. Eventually the cycle turns and people start looking a bit more for other sources of value, but it's going to be difficult yeah. for heavy asset companies to play or to, to perform well uh, as long as that process continues. But g given that we sort of agree on that, um, currently those are having a tough time. And I think that's been going on for maybe two, three years that it's been really yes. hard. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I didn't know three years ago that it would be that way or it would have been out of it. Um, sure. But does it change what you do or are you just like cycles going to turn? Um, I'm sticking with great, great undervalued assets, even if the market doesn't like them. Yeah, I don't think it's really changed my approach, but I will say I think a lot more than I did five or six, seven years ago about opportunity cost. Um, and that is that sometimes you can find an amazing company that is trading at a huge discount to, to its assets, but realistically, the company isn't generating a lot of value right now for shareholders. It's not earning a lot of cash. Uh, the free cash flow is low. It's, it's not really making a lot of great investments. It's just kind of resting on what it's already accomplished. And if you buy that company, and if they only increase their book value or their net asset value by two, 3% a year for the next 10 years, and then they sell at net asset value, we well, didn't do very well. Uh, and so I, I, I tell myself, if I'm, if I'm gonna get involved in a, in a play where I'm buying in at a big discount to asset value, that asset has to be doing something for me, whether it's kicking off cash or, or whether the asset itself is getting more valuable, which sometimes they do. The company has to be doing something for me. Uh, in order for me to buy. Um, I'm not saying if I didn't find something where it was literally 10% of asset value, I would, I'd probably still buy it just based on that level of discount. But I'm not willing to buy something at a 20 or 30% discount unless it's really doing something for me. I'm, gonna, I'm going to insist on a much, much higher uh, spread between asset value and, and market value. And so, because I could be investing in another company that's working its hardest to make money for shareholders and grow and make good investments. And, and I always have to, if I'm, if, if I'm investing in this asset play, I'm not investing in that company. And so the asset play has to be really cheap for me to. Sorry, you, um, the, the connection was a little bit oh, unstable apologize. for a moment. So I, I I'm, no, it's uh, no problem. Could be my connection. Um, right. So I think before I want to dive into some of uh, like you write up like quite a few ideas. I think like once each month on your blog. More or less. I used to write a lot. I used to write a lot more often, but I'm busier these days. Oh, well, I thought it was like once a month or something. And um, they're, right. they're great. Really recommend uh, people to read them. And I wanted to uh, talk to you about a few, um, a few of them. Uh, sure. The last thing I was wondering was like, how do, you, how do you settle on these or how do you come up with these ideas? Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the idea generation process is uh, probably the most rewarding part of the investment experience, but also maybe the most difficult. Um, I find that I used to use a lot of fundamental screens, but these days I don't find a lot of interesting companies that way. The really cheap stuff mostly has been 
has been bid up by investors or it went private or, or got taken over. And, and so that's not very productive for me. These days I, I still do screens, but I'm screening more for business characteristics rather than valuation. I might say, oh, you know, I, I want a company that has a, it's growing at a certain rate and has a certain return on capital or has certain margins or, or has a certain amount of excess cash on the balance sheet. And, and then if I generate a list of a dozen companies, I'll go see maybe if I'm lucky, maybe one of them fits my valuation criteria. I used to do it the reverse. I used to look first for valuation criteria and then, okay, maybe one of those companies meets my quality standards. I tend to do it the reverse now and I find it to be more productive, but Beyond screens, I, I monitor news flow really carefully. I mean, every day I'm on otcmarkets.com looking at every new piece of news that comes up. And, but finally, probably the most productive thing for me is just going by the brute force method. I'll go find a particular market and I'll download every company in that market and I'll take a look one by one. Um, Does that mean that you're like sometimes attracted to a particular market from like a top-down um yeah, I, I do try to find markets where I don't think there's a lot of participation by sophisticated investors, where the market is heavily retail driven, or there just is not a lot of liquidity whatsoever, and so not a lot of funds play there. Um, more recently, some of my finds where I found the, uh, the Italian small cap market is actually fascinating. There's a lot of really good little companies there that get very, very little attention from investors outside of Italy or even outside of Western Europe. And, and that can be very, very rewarding. The Australian market is interesting as well. It's heavily dominated by retail investors who are very focused on dividend yield. So if you find a company that doesn't pay a dividend or, or had to cut their dividend for some temporary reason, sometimes you can get a really good deal on those stocks. But yeah, I try, but I try to avoid markets where they're, thoroughly picked over. Everyone pays attention to them. There aren't many little known companies and those just aren't that productive for me. Hey, one of those areas that are maybe a um, um, little bit different is like, like REITs. It's actually a big area of investment, but like professional fund managers are not super keen to um, invest there. And I noticed you have like several REIT ideas mm -hmm. and um like one uh, i came across was um where you're co-tailing an activist still well and yes. um into a retail read that's probably one of the most <laughs> hated hated ones you could come up with uh, yes, could you tell true. a story or what you like about <laughs> that situation no i'd be happy to and i should say i don't actually own any of these securities but i thought they were very very interesting it's sort of a high risk, but potential very high reward sort of scenario where, and uh, I only found this idea because I've followed um, Joseph Stilwell for a long time. He's a very well-known activist, but he works mostly with small banks. And there's a lot of not very well-run small banks uh, in the US. It's known as a sort of a sleepy, boring industry that doesn't get a lot of attention. And so you find a lot of management teams that could use a not being business or, or very capable sometimes. And, and uh, Stillwell has made a career of going after some of these lazy or dishonest management teams and shaking them up. So I thought it was yeah. very interesting when he said. As so, a European, those are like small US banks and there are like thousands of them. It's really are. fascinating because we don't have that at all. You know, it's completely dominated by uh, the, the big names. And uh, yes. so it will fascinating. be Sunday in the US too. We're, we're, we have fewer banks every year, but it, we still have many, many, many banks. Yeah, I, I hope it continues that way and that <laughs> Europe will reverse that trend. I think it's terrible. But there I'm so fascinated. Banks. Like, how do you get, like, deposits? Are they just putting out great rates? Or uh, are people, like, happy to um, have deposits with, like, a local bank? Is that kind of a pride thing? or? I think that, that a lot of it is that uh, there's a lot of small towns uh, in rural places where you just, when it's time for you to open a bank account, you just walk down, you just walk down the street and whatever bank you is closest to your house, that's the one you open a, an account at. Uh, it's all, 
it's a very manual process. A lot of them still don't do everything online. And so it's easier that way. And then the people know you there. A lot of, especially older people really like that they have seen the same teller for 15 years and, and nothing changes, but that's a big part of the reason there. Yeah. But, once your bank somewhere, you're pretty unlikely uh, to switch, I guess. Uh, but true. I'm sorry I derailed you because you were telling a story oh, about uh, still it's well, fine. and this time it was after a read. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting because he's never really publicly gone after a real estate company. And, and, and the one he went after, uh, Wheeler, is terribly, terribly run. I recommend that anyone reads the letters that Still Law Group wrote to shareholders, and he just highlights. Mis mismanagement after mismanagement and, and waste and uh, borderline fraud. So, so awful. So this was the typical company that is just being run into the ground by its management and still well just trying to get involved. <clears throat> and you're absolutely right, <clears throat> excuse me, that retail is probably the most difficult segment to be in maybe of anything right now. But the majority of Wheeler's properties have a, have a grocery store as their anchor tenant. And, and grocery has held up much, much better than ordinary retail, clothing, toys, what have you. And, and so they're actually doing much better than most, re than most retail focused REITs. But there's no doubt that Wheeler is in a really tough spot. They have a lot of debt. They really, really, really need to sell some assets to, to pay down that debt quickly, but previous management didn't want to do that. And I think it comes down to, to pride like we talked about with some of these small companies, the people who ran Wheeler were really, really happy to be running a company with a balance sheet of several hundred million. No matter what the stock did, they were each receiving lots of compensation from the company for doing a terrible job. And they hardly owned any stock at all. And so they didn't care what happened to shares, but they were, they were big shots in their community because they ran this big company. And still well, wants the company to be much, much smaller, but he also wants it to be profitable and earn cash flow. And even if it results in them giving up half of their assets or more to do so. And uh, he's in control. We'll see what he can do. A lot probably depends on how, on how COVID-19 uh, affects the, the markets where Wheeler has its properties, but, but I'm cheering for the guy. He's always been a great advocate for shareholders. He, He's not afraid to tell the truth and he's not afraid to offend people doing so. But at the end of the day, the, the shareholders and the companies that where he goes activists uh, typically do very well. So we'll see what happens. Go cool. And is it a typical thing for you to uh, like uh, really look closely what activists in the um, micro cap space are doing? I enjoy following them. I, I don't, I'm not a natural activist. Uh, I don't think it's uh, something I would enjoy or, or, or have any particular skill with doing, but I find it, I find it really interesting, these people who, who have that, this, that skill and managing to approach a company and, and win over the shareholders and have them support their directors, uh, the nominees for directors or, or the strategic direction they want to take the company. I'm often very fascinated by people whose skill set is different than mine, even if we're going after the same companies, because I can always learn something from them. And so I think I've definitely taken a few pointers, but mostly I just admire them because I don't think I'd be good at it. Um, yeah, can definitely uh, relate to that. I think, uh, especially like the, um, very confrontational ones. Um, yes. I'm, watch, I'm watching in awe. <laughs> now, getting the popcorn. Um, exactly. I, uh, to, we're staying a little bit on the real estate topics and then I promise people who don't like uh, real estate, we, um, <laughs> I want to talk about other ideas. Um, but you you're also uh, wrote up New England Realty Associates. Yes. Um, that's a little bit different. It's a residentially focused. I think mm -hmm. that's maybe um, a little bit more resilient uh, through the current crisis. Yeah, what, what's your, what attracted you to, uh, to look at that? Well, uh, a lot of it came back to, this is a company that gets almost no attention from the market. Um, it, it's listed, it's fully reporting, but I don't think I've ever seen anyone talk about it or it never gets any headlines on financial media. Um, 
the numbers sometimes don't don't appear correctly on places like Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg because it has a strange structure where you're not investing in the in the REIT itself, you're investing in trust units that are the equivalent of one thirtieth of a trust unit. It, it gets complicated, but basically this company, it, 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 there's more than meets the eye. There's more than you see when you just pull it up on, on your page on, on your computer. And so I started digging in and, and the more I dug in, the more I liked what I saw. It's another case where, and this is actually a prime example of where uh, New England owns a few property investments that look not very profitable on the income statement, but if you dig a little bit deeper, they actually produce millions per year in cash flow, and so they're very, very valuable. Do, do, does your this type of equity investment uh, type precisely. you really like? I really do like that, and and also I, I like their location. I mean. Multifamily real estate can be a wonderful investment or it can be a terrible investment. It can be a terrible investment if you build a nice piece of multifamily property, an apartment building, and you want to charge a lot for it because you built it new and it's brand nice. Brand, it's really nice. It's brand new. But then next year across the street, someone builds a competing apartment building and it's, it's just as nice as yours. Guess what happens to your rent and your occupancy? They go down because you can't compete. But in a place like Boston, which is already very, very built up, very crowded, high population density, strict zoning laws. It's very, very difficult for another developer to come in and build a new apartment building down the street or across the street. And so rents are high, occupancy is very high, uh, and you tend to have good pricing power. You tend to be able to increase rents three or 4% a year. Uh, and so I think that's one of the best things about real estate is, okay, you build the tower, you build the property, whatever. That's a big investment. You finance it partly with equity, partly with debt. Great. You fill it up. And then if you did, if it's a good property, you can increase the price almost every year over time. And that's almost pure profit because your interest doesn't go up. Your maintenance goes up a little bit over time, but not as ideally not as quickly as your, as your rents do. So yeah, real estate done well can be a tremendous investment. Now, it can also be horrible if done poorly, but if you identify the good operators with the good assets, you can really have something. Cool, yeah, I think the, like if you have the zoning laws and they're just getting stricter and stricter, that's a real tailwind. Or, uh, it really is. Yeah, um, in Europe too, it can be um, ridiculous sometimes in uh, some urban areas. Sure. Um, so then there's a little bit of... Uh, little bit of asset play, a little bit of a real estate thing, but you yeah. wrote up a fascinating security and it's the <laughs> Society Fermière du Casino Municipal de Cannes. Uh, <laughs> yes. I probably butchered that, but uh, it's a French company and it's got some uh, like, like beautiful properties in um, beautiful places in, in France, like Cannes is uh, very well known. Yes. Um, yeah, but how did you find that? And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, could you tell the story of, like what kind of amazing things they have? Of course, of course. Yeah, so one of my favorite things to do is screen for for a thousand sometimes in whatever currency you're, you're dealing with. I find that investors avoid those companies for, for a lot of reasons. And a lot of it is just a fallacy. I mean, people have no trouble buying a stock for two and thinking, oh, if I'm right, it'll double it to four and they'll make a hundred percent. For some reason, everyone thinks stocks can go from two to four or two to six or two to 10 with no problem. Same thing can happen. A stock can go from 1,000 to 5,000 or 10,000. You made the exact same amount of money, but psychologically it's easier for, investors to buy lower price stocks. So a lot of times these high priced companies don't get much attention. Okay, so this is the principle of you, you buy a company that's got a really high priced stock. Um, mm -hmm. just, just buying one stock will take a thousand dollars or more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And I find that they get less attention 
And uh, a lot of investors think, well, there are, the price is already so high, it can't go any higher. And of course, that makes no sense. It's, it's market cap and enterprise value that matter, not the price of the stock. Yeah. But it's a common uh, psychological uh, bias that people oh, but have. But Robinhood might be messing that up because uh, <laughs> they do fractional shares now, right? That's true. It doesn't seem to keep Tesla or, or Apple from, from going any higher. Or, but uh, or does true. Robinhood have OTC? Uh, they don't. Act- act- they do actually. Ah, okay. So this, yeah. this is still... What's okay. me? <laughs> Yeah, but, but that's how I found it. And then I realized there was almost no trading liquidity and something like 90% of the shares were held by just a small handful of investors. And that's a great setup for me This because I know this, this stock will get no attention from investors because it's so liquid, it's, it's so high priced. And then as I researched the company, I realized it fulfills another major uh, investment theme of mine, which is investing in scarce assets. I really, really like the concept of investing in companies that own things that cannot be duplicated, no matter how hard anyone wants to. Probably the first investment like this I ever came across was a Swiss company called Jungfrau Bond, which operates uh, Alpine railways, uh, tourist railroads high in the Swiss Alps that take you high up into the mountain to go skiing or stay at the chalet or the observatory but or, the or scenery whatever. is amazing i think there are like discovery programs that just um show like footage from the train eh. yes <laughs> you're, you're exactly right okay. and there's nowhere else like that uh and the thing is the swiss government will never let anyone else build a new railway up the side of the swiss alps for environmental reasons and for it would ruin the views. Oh, it's beyond expensive. That's so much. like something, so, something they did in history, but it's never going to happen again. Exactly. Most of these railways are a century old, uh, but they're owned by private operators. And that means pricing power for, for as long as people want to go to the top of the Swiss Alps to enjoy the view and the amenities and, and the stay and the clean air, those railways will be the only way to get up there. And that means yeah. pricing power. That mean, that's, that's a barrier to entry. Yeah, um, the, so I like that. The ceiling is probably uh, like choppers, like competing. Probably. With, uh... I, I think you're exactly right. And so very, I view uh, real estate on the French Riviera very similarly. And I won't try to pronounce the name, the name of the company. I don't speak French. I will, I'll massacre the, the name. When I found this company that had these... Uh, five-star beautiful hotels located right in the most expensive district uh, of this French coastal city that caught my eye. Because no matter how much a competitor wants to build a a brand new, super luxury, high-end five-star hotel in that location, there's just nowhere left to do it. Uh, There's all the prime locations are already taken by the existing operators. And so it's very, very difficult to get into that market as a competitor. You basically have to buy one of the existing properties and then put your own remodel however you want to or something like that. But it's almost inconceivable that a, a large supply of new hotel rooms come online on the, on the Mediterranean coast of France. It's just not likely. And so the incumbents have high pricing power and, uh, and we'll, be, we'll be able to increase their prices in the future as time goes on. Now, I guess there's always something to visit the Mediterranean coast and the south of France for probably a thousand years. And I, I think I, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a revolutionary concept, but Nonetheless, uh, I find it very attractive as an investor to buy things that can't be replicated. And so, yeah, when I saw this company that had gorgeous hotels and a couple of gambling licenses as well, I thought this bears investigation. And then it was actually cheap on top of all that. Yeah, and it's like a place that's sort of famous for that elite goes there. And mm-hmm. that's usually pretty sticky. Uh, you see that across the globe. You do, um, you do. Yeah, and I mean, there's more coast being developed in Europe, like Portugal is getting better. 
sure, um, sure. but that's not the same thing it's uh this is i think you called it like a cheap luxury company or something too right so like a it really was, and I, and I don't mean the lux- I don't mean the luxuries they offer are cheap. They're not cheap at all. But the price of the company in the stock market is very, very cheap compared to what you're buying. Yeah, well, actually, well, like LVMH, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, or Prada or Burberry, yes. they all get like huge multiples on uh, mm-hmm. their assets, and I'm not sure if. Yeah, it's actually like a very luxury hotel chain trading. I think it's trading Oriental, I think Mandarin Oriental or something. Yes. Um, but that has its own problems. I think it's family control or something. But uh, Typically, the Hong Kong listed conglomerates have their own issues with corporate governance. And the question is if you end, actually end up benefiting from the company's success. But, but yes, uh, on a per room basis, they look very, very affordable. And here they're controlling shareholders too, right? But they're yes. um, like, they're not, I think they're different parties. Is that tr- true? Right. There, there's a wealthy family whose investment vehicle owns maybe 80% of the stock. I'm blanking on their name right now. And, okay. and then a, a Qatari investment group uh, owns another 10%. And, and I think they're doing it for the exact reason that they're very, very long-term investors and they think that this region will, will remain appealing for centuries to come. So only 10% of the float is really trading. That's about right. Yeah, it's wow. a couple, it could be a couple percentage higher or lower. I don't exactly remember, but, but it's very, very small. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think um, like hotels and casinos are both doing not great in the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation. Sure. But I was thinking that, um, and I read a little bit along those lines that like the super high end isn't doing that bad uh, because they can do a lot more, um, you know, to um, mitigate some of the danger of COVID-19 and people may actually use it to isolate themselves. Uh, like, do you think there's some truth to that or uh, you're not sure? I absolutely do. Um, think about it. If you have access to a private jet, you can go anywhere and not really worry about being exposed during your flight. And, and in the U.S., we've seen um, a lot of places that are isolated but have a lot of luxury housing. Have seen a lot of people fleeing from New York or or Los Angeles or wherever, and just saying, "Well, I'm just gonna I'll just stay here until things go back to normal." And, I'm sure it's the same dynamic other places. Yeah. Um, hey, I've been keeping you uh, for an hour already. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about, um, you've got a, like a kind of a top-down thesis on like rural t- telecoms. Yes. That was, you still have some time to talk about that or uh, um, otherwise we could do it another time. Um, Absolutely. I have time. I, I thought that was a fascinating um, uh, way you looked at that. Um, well, maybe you, you can explain it better than I do. Sure. So you're exactly right. Uh, rural telecoms have been a, a large investment for Alluvial and will likely remain so for some time. And, and the biggest reason is uh, the market does not understand these companies. Um, if you ask most investors or, or even most people, uh, what would you think about investing in a, in a rural telephone company? And they would look at you like you're insane. They would say, why on earth would I do that? Um, who has a telephone anymore? Everything's, everything's wireless or, or, you know, or who even lives out there? But people do. And um, these companies have actually done a tremendous job in uh, reinventing themselves. It's years ago. About 60, 65% of these companies' revenues were your traditional landline telephone. And fewer and fewer people need that or have that anymore. But what these companies have been so successful in doing is transitioning those users over to broadband internet, which anymore is as essential as water or or heat or or cooling at your house, uh, especially for younger people. Uh, I can hardly imagine not having an internet connection in my house. I couldn't work. 
could never watch a movie on Netflix and unwind in the evening. My kids would hate it. They couldn't watch their shows on the iPad or, or, or whatever. And it's the same across the country. People need broadband. And so the, the percentage I cited earlier of 65% landline and 35% whatever else is almost flipping for a lot of the companies. Uh, some of them are now 50% broadband and 50% landline. Some of them have already got a majority broadband and that will continue. Fewer and fewer people will have a landline telephone. It makes sense, who needs it? But more and more people, no matter where, where they are, will always need broadband. And some people in rural areas still don't have access to that. But the U.S. federal government is subsidizing rural telecom providers to install fiber in places that have never had inter high-speed internet before and bring those people into the 21st century, century uh, essentially. So what you have is companies that everyone thinks are slowly dying uh, and they trade at four or five times cash flows. But what's actually happening is they're reinventing themselves into a, a company that will be relevant for the next century by now, providing internet. Well, you know, if they get subsidized, to, otherwise it's not cost effective to supply uh, broadband to rural areas. Precisely. Uh, but, but um, do they retain like pricing power or is, are there some uh, limitations on uh, what they can subsequently charge? There are some limitations and, and, and frankly, you're right. A, a lot of the places where they're now reaching for the first time, they, never, they could never do it without subsidies because it's not profitable to build a two mile length of fiber down a, a rural road to serve five households at the end of that road. It's just, no. it just never will be. But, but essentially, it's, it's actually a rare area of interest by, uh, by politicians in the U.S. Um, all of them basically agree that rural America needs better internet access, whether they're the most conservative or, or the most uh, or the most progressive. They, they all want that to happen. And so there's a lot of bipartisan support for these subsidies. They're not going away. Yeah, I and follow so, like, the T-Mobile um, uh, case. Um, mm -hmm. the, and it was surprising to me how um, often that argument was brought up. And, yeah, uh, it's... It's essential. I mean, rural America has had a lot of economic difficulties, but one thing that would definitely help is better internet access. And that's the role that a lot, a lot of these small rural telecom companies will play. And so a lot of these companies, they trade at a free cash flow yield and in the teens. And I really feel like, I think it should be a lot lower based on the security and the stability of these companies. They're, they're the new utilities. Uh, yeah. And so that's, that's yeah. my argument. Part of your thesis was like that they get um, valued off like, or maybe I'm misinterpreting this, but that they were valued off like the larger competitors in uh, broadband who are often not as rural focused. And they tend to have a lot of depth because traditionally you could put a lot of depth on uh, tel telcos. It was a very, um, you know, sustainable cash flow stream. Um, and then they, you, you know, they get the same multiple. Do you think that's a factor? Or? I think that's very much the case. I mean, you have a, a handful of large uh, legacy telcos in the U.S., uh, CenturyLink, Frontier, and they all had the same problem. Number one, they had way too much debt because it used to be these were very stable and you could put that much debt, but then their landline revenue started to decline. But the second thing that's probably just as, much, just as important is they face really, really um, high levels of competition. Uh, CenturyLink and, and Frontier and a couple other, the big ones, they service higher density areas where there's already a, a cable company and maybe another competitor. And, and so they're, they're in a, the fight of their lives against these competitors. On the other hand, a lot of these truly small, truly very rural telecom companies are the only ones around. There's no cable. Sometimes they are the cable provider, even if they're a telco. And it's not attractive for any of the large uh, cable companies or legacy telcos to, to invest there because overbuilding a second fiber optic network on top of the first is rarely cost effective and, and rarely competitive. And so, yeah, the balance sheets are better. The competitive dynamics are yeah. much, much better for the small versus the very large. And do they often have like a sizable dividend or um, uh, is still retaining um, cash flow to? 
build out those uh, lines? They've taken different approaches. Uh, one of my holdings at LICT Corporation has, has no, de no net debt and they buy back lots and lots of shares. Um, another one of mine, Nuvera, takes a balanced approach. They pay down some debt. They don't have a lot of debt, but they still pay it down and they pay a dividend and they buy back a little bit of shares. So each company is a little bit different in how they approach their capital allocation, but they're all uh, paying shareholders directly, more or less. Cool. And now, uh, which ones are your, like, your favorite ones? Yeah, so I, I own two at the moment in the U.S. I own a LSTT Corporation, and I, I absolutely own this, so I am talking my book here. But, but they trade at $18,000 a share, and that's one reason they don't get a lot of attention from investors, because that's a big, that's a lot of money to write out just for one share. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and they're actually controlled by uh, Mario Gabelli, one of the most famous investors of all time, and, and he does great. They're, they're really, really well run. My other one is uh, Nuvera Communications, and they're statistically, uh, statistically, uh, they're Gabelli, a lot cheaper. Uh, so, mention the company ever, or uh, because he, he gets on CNBC and stuff like that. He really doesn't, mostly because it's very illiquid and it's not sure. SEC registered, and so he doesn't really talk about it. Yeah. But he goes, he's always there at the annual meeting and he talks, it's, he likes the investment. He just can't really talk about it. Okay. And yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's my, so that's it's my still, largest. It's still got some market cap then, right? Because otherwise it would be like inconsequential to him. No, I mean, you're right. I think his investment in it is worth about 120 million and, and he's a billionaire. So it's not his largest investment, but that's, that's a lot of money. That's, Okay. A lot of money. So yes, he still pays a lot of attention to it. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, that's a fun one. And I noticed you also uh, own like a little bit of uh, Frontier Communication debt. Mm -hmm. And that debt is uh, really cheap. <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Why did you uh, buy that up? Yeah, you know, I'd followed the company closely because it is a, uh, it's a comparable to uh, some of my rural telecoms and always knew that it had a lot, of, a lot of problems. It had some very heavy competition. It was really, really poorly run and it had way too much debt. So I always knew that it probably will go bankrupt, but maybe some of the debt might be an interesting valuation if you see what that debt would be converted into following the bankruptcy, what sort of value you would get. And I don't own the debt right now. I, I bought it. I bought a little bit of it. And it was trading at about twenty-five cents on the dollar. It traded up to about thirty cents, and and I sold. It was never meant to be a long-term investment. It was just a quick trade for me. But essentially, it's it's so interesting. Um, it, a lot like the small uh, telco operators, people act as if Frontier is just terminally hopeless. That there's no chance of turning it around. When really what it would take to turn around is just a major uh, CapEx investment, just invest several billion dollars in the network and make it a good network. It's a bad network right now with enough money. It could be a good network. Um, and so uh, I just thought the, uh, the look through valuation by buying the debt at around 25 cents on the dollar, you were creating the post bankruptcy company at about three times EBITDA, which is too low even for a uh, not very good rural telco, even a bad rural telecom should trade it at least four times uh, EBITDA. And so I thought, this is just ridiculously cheap. I'm going to buy a little bit of it. It's probably going to go up a little bit. And, and that's what happened. Uh, I still watch it. And if the debt got that cheap again, you might see me buying it. Buying it. But when it's at 30, I have more interesting things to buy elsewhere. But it was just uh, my familiarity with the company led me to think that would, the odds were in my favor at that price and, and it worked out okay. Okay, that's fair. Um, hey, now maybe uh, one last thing. In um, I'm hearing all these things about like satellite internet stuff. There's uh, Elon Musk wants to launch Starlink. Um, is, that, is that a threat to rural um, internet at all? Or moderately so. Um, we'll have to see what the ultimate pricing ends up being for, uh, for users, uh, for, for Starlink. Uh, I don't expect it to be competitive with, um, the current cable or, or telco connection that's available for most rural consumers. 
there will be some just incredibly rural people who may want to use Starlink because otherwise it'll be 10 years before the telecom or the cable company rolls out a cable out to their, out to their doorstep. And so it might make sense for them. But I'd be more worried if I were a small telecom company that wasn't investing in 5G spectrum. Most of the small telcos out there are currently buying wireless uh, spectrum that will enable them to deliver 5G speed wireless in their service area. Uh, LICT is doing that, Nuvera is doing that, virtual, various others are doing that. But if you're a really small rural telco with really poor finances and you can't afford to buy this spectrum, you may lose some customers to a satellite solution over the next decade. But color me a little bit skeptical. Uh, I, a lot of the things that Elon Musk claims he can do are more marketing than reality, especially at first. And so I think, I think Starlink has a lot of proving itself to do, but I don't see it as a major threat to the existing telcos uh, for now. Okay, it's, um, if, if you can buy something at uh, like four times cash flow, uh, that's the Starlink has to come online quicker than most of Elon Musk's timelines play I out. So. <laughs> I think so. Uh, and it has to be about $200 a month, which uh, is what it could be with the base station you have to have and all that. Who knows? I, I, I conjecture, but... We're a long way from Starlink being a, being a real competitor to the majority of these companies. Yeah. Okay. So that's, um, that's interesting. And about uh, 5G, um, there's, um, I don't fully understand um, that whole debate, but uh, it's pretty hard to get that spectrum together, is my understanding. And the government is maybe on part of it, maybe with the military. Is that mm -hmm. correct? And that's that's correct, yeah, and that may or may not change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of debate over that right now. But but honestly, that debate mostly affects some of the larger operators like like Charter or Comcast or AT and T, Verizon. It it doesn't have much of an impact on some of the smaller operators who who have enough spectrum to operate five G services uh, without having to get into those. Um, maybe possibly available, maybe not available uh, bandwidths. All right. And then for rural, uh, it's maybe, it all doesn't matter too much be, because here in, you know, urban areas, I'm hearing a lot of resistance about uh, uh, these mosques because they're like, like tiny stations, right? Mm -hmm. And they yes. only reach a very sh uh, short um, it's a high frequency, so it's only short range, and you have to place a lot of masks, and that means they're in people ho uh, on people's houses, and yeah. they're worried. Yeah, it, it's a major, major uh, infrastructure project, especially in highly urbanized areas, because you have so many obstacles. These these wavelengths don't travel well through even concrete or steel or or anything like that. In rural areas where there are fewer obstructions, it's a little easier, but. Yeah, it's it's going to be a major, major debate. Yeah, and also there are not so many alternatives, so then people are also more accepting, I think. Exactly. Uh, hey, I think uh, I've I've uh, been keeping you very long, so I'll I'll wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for uh, being on, and um, please tell people where can they find you, uh, learn more more about your firm, and uh, read your uh, excellent blog. Sounds good. Yeah, so the blog is just uh, otcadventures.com. That's where I write up my little profiles of the various unusual and overlooked companies I find. Uh, my investment management, <laughs> yeah. My investment management company is Alluvial Capital Management, A-L-L-U-V-I-A-L. -L -L and you can just go to alluvialcapital.com for that. And then I'm where does alluvial come from? In my hand, uh, a landscape created by water. Um, it's just a. I like Dave, the word. I'm so, no sorry. Used it before. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. You have to repeat uh, the last bit because the um, uh, connection got mixed up. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So alluvial is just a word that essentially means created by water. 
So an alluvial landscape was created by a glacier or a river or a stream. And it's just uh, the, the landscape of where I live in Western Pennsylvania is largely alluvial caused by glaciers. And I liked the word, so I chose it. And it's but, maybe, you know, it, it's, uh, it takes a long time for the landscape to change. Uh, that's true, very true. So it's, uh, yes. Uh, I'm on thanks. Twitter as Alluvial Capital as well. I'm, I'm pretty active on there. So, yeah, happy to talk to anybody. Okay, well, thank you very much. And then um, um, hope to see you another time. Bye-bye. Um,